Hello, Legal Roadmap Podcast listeners and Facebook Live watchers. I am back with another installment in our series on legal for course creators today. And we are going to be deep diving into choosing a solid and protectable name for your course. So this is kind of the lead in to thinking about protecting the trademarks in your course business. The first thing you have to do is choose a name for your course that actually can be protected. And I'm gonna be going into today why some course names actually probably cannot be protected with a US trademark registration. So not every name is protectable. So we wanna make sure you choose one that is both a great name for your course that tells people what it is, but also that if later your course grows to a point where you want to register the trademarks, that you're actually able to do that. So this is episode 102. If you are looking for show notes or any of the resources that I mentioned in this episode, those will all be at awbfirm.com slash podcast 102 after the podcast episode launches. So this is not launching for a couple weeks. If you're watching this on Facebook Live, um, you will have to wait just a little bit until that page goes live. But I am going to be mentioning a really, really great um, downloadable resource that goes with this episode. So you're definitely going to want to check that out. All right, so let's dive into what kind of course names actually are protectable. I like to think about this as kind of a spectrum or think of a ruler or a rainbow, whatever visual helps you think about this. But um, on one end, I'll call it my ruler. On one end of the ruler, we have the most highly protectable names. And um, I guess I should start by saying, what is a trademark? What is um, protectable under US trademark law and give my standard disclaimer, which is that I am a lawyer. I am not your lawyer unless you hire our firm and decide to work with us one-on-one. Everything I'm talking about today is really just information. This is not legal advice. Um, Trademarks in the United States are used to protect things that indicate the source of a product or service. So what does what the heck does that mean? Typically, it's going to be your brand name, a company name, or the name of one of your products. So when I'm working with course creators, Typically, the thing that is most protectable by trademarks in their business, the thing that's most valuable is the name of their course. That's the thing that if someone else copied it and were marketing a similar course with a similar name, they could potentially you know, steal your customers. They could confuse people in the marketplace. If you are looking for Marie Forleo's B School and someone else is selling something similar by the exact same name, that's gonna be very confusing. If people are Googling it or they're looking for it on social media, um, they're trying to find information about how to purchase her course and someone else or many other people were marketing something with the same name, it's very difficult for me to see which is the B School that I wanna buy. So trademark law in the United States is basically intended to protect consumers to help us make sure that when we are looking for a product, we can find the one we want, um, that you can allow a brand to kind of establish a reputation for itself in the marketplace so that if you are of a certain quality or you have certain features or characteristics that people come to expect from your product or your service, they know that when they find something with that brand name on it, they know what they're getting. So that is my one minute background on what what the heck is a trademark. Before we launch into the more specific, how do you make sure to choose a good course name that is actually protectable under our trademark law in the United States? So going back to my ruler, on one end are the most protectable names. So these are typically going to be company names, or you sometimes see these with pharmaceutical names, and these are these totally made up words. They are what's called arbitrary under trademark law. So things like Xerox or Pepsi, or some of the weird pharmaceutical names like Chantix or Zizol, um, they have no meaning outside of whatever meaning you develop by your marketing and advertising efforts. So it is not a real word in the English language or in another language. It just means your product. It kind of, that's why it's the strongest because you develop all of the brand recognition and the brand characteristics. Um, It's highly protectable because no one else is just going to use that on accident or they're not gonna use it to describe their products or service. You created it, you kind of own it just because it is so weird, it is a made up word. So that's what we call arbitrary trademarks. We don't typically see that much in the online course or digital product space because we are trying to sell people solutions to their problems. Uh, And so using a made up word just doesn't really get us where we're trying to go. So I want you to know that there are arbitrary trademarks out there, but typically we're not gonna see those in the online course space. 
So moving slightly down your ruler, slightly less protectable, but still a great choice for a trademark or for a course name, um, is what we are going to call, oh, and I'm sorry, um, the first category is fanciful, not arbitrary. <laughs> I've got my post-it note and I've got, got things out of order. So those made up words are fanciful. Moving next down the ruler uh, is what is actually called arbitrary. I may go back and re-record this for the podcast. Um, so our arbitrary trademarks are things that are real words, either in this language or in another language, but they are being used in a different way than what their meaning is. And it's hard to explain in the abstract, so I'll give you some examples. So this would be like Apple for computers. So it is a real word, Apple is a real word, but it has nothing to do with um, computers. Or Mont Blanc for pens. Mont Blanc is, you know, uh, in French it means white mountain, but it has nothing to do with pens. Uh, or nothing that I'm aware of that has to do with pens. So it is a real word, it has a meaning, but you're using it in an arbitrary way. So again, this is something we don't see a lot in online courses because it's not very helpful. It's not going to help us communicate what problem we are solving for our students. So I'm moving one more down the ruler to this is kind of our middle ground and this is where we see a lot of online course names fall. And this is still protectable it's still a good choice for your online course name. And this is what we call suggestive. So I'm gonna give you a bunch of examples. This is where you're using words that do have a meaning, that do um, you know, somewhat describe what you're selling or the problem you're solving or who it's for, but it's not obvious. So I'll give you a couple examples. So B-School, with Marie Forleo's signature program, which is a business training course for online business, that's um, a good example. So. It does have a meaning. We all know what B school is, it's business school, but it's not being used exactly in the way, I mean, she's not providing you an MBA. This is not like you're going to college and going to business school. It's kind of a little bit of a different way of using that. Um, another another um, example is Being Boss. So that is a popular podcast, and then they've also got educational products under that same brand. Um, again, they're not saying um, online business training for creative entrepreneurs. It's not exactly describing the thing that they're offering, but it does give you an idea. This is about being your own boss, you know, without being quite so obvious. It's a little bit abbreviated. So again, that's more suggestive. Um, two other examples from some friends of mine, um, Scalability Lounge is Haley Burkhead's signature program. So it kind of gives you an idea of what you're doing, but it's a lounge, you know, you're not saying, I will teach you how to scale your business. <laughs> that would be really descriptive and obvious. Um, so it gives you a sense of what it is, and hers is actually a membership program. So, you know, the lounge kind of gives you an idea that it's a place to hang out, or it's, um, you know, a group of people coming together. Um, another one from my friend Tyler McCall, um, who his uh, interview episode on the Legal Roadmap podcast will air in a few weeks, uh, follower to fan society. So again, he helps people learn how to use Instagram. And so he's not exactly saying, I will teach you how to turn your Instagram fans from follower or Instagram uh, followers into fans. That would be more descriptive, more obvious, but follower to fan society, he's giving you an idea of the things he's going to help you with without exactly saying it. Um, and then the last one, I, the last example, uh, Build a Better Beta is a program by Lindsay Padilla, who also is on the podcast this season. Um, she teaches people how to build a beta version of their online course. But again, she does not, her title is not how to build a beta version of your online course. She's giving you an idea of what it's about without outright saying it. So you can see how some of these um, titles they're using maybe some words or they're maybe getting close to telling you exactly what they're doing, but they're not quite filling in all the blanks. So with suggestive trademarks, you kind of have to take a little bit of a leap. You um, have to use either use your imagination or you have to kind of make a logical jump to get from the name to what is the service that they're offering or who are the people that they're targeting. Now moving down the ruler, um, this is an area that you may wanna consider staying away from. These are descriptive trademarks. So it's not the end of the world if you choose a descriptive trademark. These can be protected under US trademark law, but if you are able to register them with the US Patent and Trademark Office, you're going to get a lower level of protection than if you choose a suggestive or arbitrary or especially fanciful mark. 
So I just want you to be aware as you're getting into this territory, um, this is where we start to maybe get some refusals from the US Patent and Trademark Office or um, we have to register at a lower level of protection on what's called the supplemental register, which gives you a little bit less protection than if you're on that principal register, which is typically where I wanna be. But it's not the end of the world. You can still get a trademark certificate. I have lots of clients on the supplemental register and it works just fine for them. So, but it's something I want you to be aware of that this is not necessarily where you want to land if you can avoid it. So um, some examples here, and these are pretend examples. I don't think these exist. I didn't Google them, but I just kind of made them up. Um, if you, this is where you're really um, very expressly and explicitly describing the either the products and services you're selling or the market that you're selling them to, the audience that you're targeting. So um, guitar school <laughs> would be one example, um, or how to play guitar. You know, those are, it's very obvious what you're doing. Uh, marketing for nurses or online marketing 101. Um, those kinds of things where you're saying exactly what you're doing. Um, you know, I work with um, Amy Porterfield and she has a very popular new program called Digital Course Academy. Um, and that is on the supplemental register. That is a registered trademark on the supplemental register because the US Patent and Trademark Office found that it was descriptive. So again, it says exactly what it is. It's gonna teach you how to do a digital course. It's very, there's no logical leap required. Um, there's no, Im, you know, implied meaning. It, it says what it is. So I will say the benefit to choosing a descriptive name for your course is that it makes marketing very easy. So that is the benefit. The downside is our trademark law is really meant to give a monopoly to one business over certain words. And so the US Patent and Trademark Office doesn't wanna do that if you're gonna keep someone from just being able to say what it is they're teaching or what it is their course is about or who it is that they're teaching it to. So that's why when you get into these really descriptive um, course names or trademarks, that's why you're gonna get a lower level of protection if you're able to get it at all. And going to the very far end of the ruler, now we're at what is called a generic trademark. And this is what you really wanna stay away from because these are not protectable, not even on the supplemental register. Um, and these would be things like online course. <laughs> so you're literally just saying the thing that you're selling or clock or computer or notepad. I mean, it literally is the thing that you are selling. Um, so those are never gonna be protectable. We definitely want to stay away from those because you can never stop someone else from using a similar name. And really that is the name of the game when it comes to trademarks. We want you to be able to build your own brand awareness, build up your product, let people know that it is yours and they know what to expect. They know what they're getting if they buy from you and to be able to stop someone else from trying to kind of ride your coattails. And if you have done a lot of marketing and uh, built up your reputation for providing a really high quality product, you don't want someone else to come along and start using the same name and start stealing your customers who are trying to find you because they know they want your stuff. That is the whole point of trademark law. It's to protect consumers, but really the benefit is also to the business who is able to build their brand, build their reputation, and then stop other people from um, you know, piggybacking on that reputation and that brand. The last thing I do want to mention is um, location names are tricky under trademark law. Those are generally not gonna be protectable either. So one uh, example that I give is like a Chattanooga pizza company. I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, again, because the point of trademark law is that you cannot stop someone from using words that just describe their goods or services. Um, location names are generally not protectable because they are so descriptive and you wouldn't want to stop someone else from saying, I own a Chattanooga pizza shop or you know, Main Street Flowers. Um, street names are often not protectable either. Um, using your name in a course is another thing to consider. Now names can be protectable under trademark law, um, individual names. I'm sure you all have probably heard about the Kardashians and how many trademarks they have in their portfolio using a lot of them using their individual names. And so you can sometimes protect a name under US trademark law, but the general rule is you have to have a level of celebrity or you have to have what's called secondary meaning or acquired distinctiveness. And that's where basically you are so well known in connection with the products and services that you're selling under your name that um, people do associate your name with that product. 
Um, and that usually either takes a certain amount of time selling um, your products or services under your name, or it takes a certain level of uh, basically advertising dollars. You have to invest in building that market share um, and you have to provide evidence to the US Patent and Trademark Office showing them you know, that you're well known, that people associate your name with your products and services. You can show, you know, if you've gotten a lot of news coverage, let's say you had uh, a product that went viral under your name and so you got a ton of press coverage, that could be a way to do that. But in general, just using your name, so like Autumn Boyd's legal class, <laughs> it, that's gonna be tough to protect. Um, so not, not a no-go the way that location names typically are, but just something to be aware of. And then one um, little note, um, I see a lot of people, especially if you have a course about how to use a technology or use a social media platform or um, use someone else's product or service. Um, so example, if you have an online course on how to use LinkedIn or an online course on how to um, get more Pinterest um, followers or clicks or uh, how to grow your Instagram following. When you're talking about someone else's trademarked word, um, you are gonna wanna be careful about that. And I'm not gonna dive into that on this episode, but just know that in a couple of weeks, I am going to be doing a whole episode of the Legal Roadmap podcast all about using other people's intellectual property. And we'll dive into how to use other people's names or not <laughs> in your online course name or product. So I hope that was helpful. Seeing that kind of ruler with Fanciful at one end, fanciful is gonna be the most protectable. Those are those totally weird made up words. And then at the other end, your generic words that are totally not protectable. And as I said, most of us are gonna fall somewhere in between, but I, I would recommend if you are thinking of a new course name to try and land somewhere in that suggestive or maybe descriptive um, area where you're telling people enough that they know what either who it's for or what kind of problem you're going to solve but you're not just outright being very obvious about it um, that's kind of the magical place um, it will help you um, you know develop your own brand and your own market without being quite so obvious that if later you decide you're ready to register you can't it's not protectable all right, so that was the first thing, just choosing a name. Now, the second thing, after you have brainstormed, and I'm hoping that through this, maybe you were scribbling down some ideas, or you sit down and you do a mind map. There's lots of different ways. I'm not particularly good at naming, to be honest. Um, and I work with a lot of my clients on running a trademark search, which is what I'm gonna talk to you about next. And then we sometimes hit a dead end. We find someone else is already using the name that they had hoped to use. And so um, they'll ask me for suggestions, and I'm not very good about that. But there are people out there, there are naming experts who are really good about this if this is not your cup of tea um, there's lots of ways but ideally you should start out with a couple names because chances are if you've come up with something you think is really clever um, suggestive but not too descriptive uh, someone else may already be using it so you may find through doing these search techniques that I'm going to talk about next that someone else has already gotten there first and in that event it's probably not a good idea for you to move forward in the United States, we have what is called a race system for trademark rights. So that means the first person or company to actually use a trademark in a business with a particular set of products or services, they win the race, they get all the rights. So if someone else is already using a name with a similar course, either on a similar topic or aimed at similar people, um, chances are pretty good that you're gonna wanna stay away from that because they probably have already won the race and they could come after you for trademark infringement if you come second to the marketplace. You always wanna be first. Um, there's, there's some ways that you can maybe decide whether um, you could coexist in the marketplace, but typically that's gonna be more risky and you are definitely gonna wanna talk with a lawyer if you are wanting to coexist with someone who has a similar trademark for a similar product or service. There are examples of where people can exist um, so my favorite example of this is Delta Airlines and Delta Faucets because they're two totally different kinds of products and services. One is an airline, one is uh, plumbing fixtures. So we are not gonna have any customer confusion about whether my faucet came from the airline company. Those are really, really different kinds of products. But if we had maybe somebody selling digital downloads, so maybe you're selling um, you know, downloadable workbooks and someone else has an online course, that is pretty darn close. So if you are in that second scenario where you're thinking about using a trademark that someone else is already using for a similar product or service, maybe it's not exactly the same, 
then you are definitely going to want to consult with a lawyer and see, you know, what get an opinion on whether that may be too close and maybe putting you at a big risk of having to rebrand later, which is what we want to avoid. We want to choose a clean name, a clean trademark right from the outset because you're going to be spending money and putting effort and energy into marketing and building your brand, building your awareness in the market. And you do not want to have to redo that in a year when you get a cease and desist letter from someone. You want to know right at the outset kind of what your risks are. What does the marketplace look like? So I cannot recommend highly enough, after you've done your brainstorming, now you're gonna do your search. And there's three searches, or three and a half, four, that I typically recommend. And you can do these on your own. This is where that worksheet that I mentioned um, is gonna come in handy. If you go to the show notes page for this episode, you can grab that. It's awbfirm.com slash podcast 102. It's the numbers, 102. And you can get this free worksheet to help you both choose a name. So I'll have, you know, all those examples that I just mentioned about the different sides of the spectrum and where you want to land and then how to do your search. So the first search that I want you to think about is the USPTO website, but that is only going to catch registered or pending trademarks. So it's not going to catch everything because in the United States, we also have common law trademarks. These are unregistered trademarks. These are state law rights, but they are still trademark rights. So just searching the USPTO database is not going to get you where you need to go. But I like to start with the USPTO database because you know if someone has gone to the time and trouble and expense, it's very expensive to register a trademark in the United States. If someone has gone through that whole process, they are likely, you know, they're invested in that trademark. They are probably going to spend time and energy to defend it and to go, you know, look and see, is anyone else doing something similar? Do I um, want to send a cease and desist letter? They're, they're likely to be more active in protecting their rights because they have kind of planted their flag in the sand and, um, you know, put their money where their mouth is. They have actively tried to protect that trademark. So if something pops up in the USPTO database for the same or very similar trademark, you're probably gonna wanna look somewhere else. Uh, let's say the USPTO search comes back clean. So next, I want you to just go to the Google and do a good Google search, especially if you are providing online products or services or you're in the digital marketing world. This is going to show you what is out there. This may not catch everything. There may be, you know, an old school company in another state that you're not going to catch, especially if they're just manufacturing physical products or they're very local. So it's not going to catch everything, but it's going to give you a pretty good idea, especially in the online space of what you need to be aware of. So I want you to do a Google search and then I want you to go deep. So don't just go to the first page, but click through, go to page four, five, six, because that is where sometimes you'll find these you know very small not high profile people or companies but you could have somebody with prior rights who's doing something similar to what you want to do so you want to be aware of that uh, and if you are interested in more help on running your own search i want to refer you back to episode 45 of this podcast where i went into kind of evaluating your search results and how close is too close um, because what happens with a lot of trademark searches and this happens with us too um, you run a search and you get something back and it's not and it's not an exact match. It's maybe similar or maybe it has a different spelling or it sounds the same, but it's not exactly the same meaning. You know, we have a lot of um, similar but not exact search results. And so figuring out how close is too close. That's why they pay us the big bucks here at the AWB firm. But you can work on doing your own kind of initial evaluation, especially if you've got, you know, six or eight names that you're just looking at. It's very expensive to hire a lawyer to run six or eight searches. So this would help you um, if you are thinking of registering a trademark down the road. This kind of helps you um, process of elimination. You can at least do an initial look. And then if you do want to move forward and get a higher level of protection with that U.S. trademark registration, then at that point, you're going to want to bring a lawyer in. We run a search for every client that we do a trademark registration for. I won't do a trademark registration without it because the USPTO attorney is going to do the same search at the USPTO um, when they are evaluating your trademark application. And I, I hate for a client to go through all of the time and trouble and money of filing a trademark registration application. And then it gets bounced because there is the same or very similar trademark already registered. So we wanna know what does the uh, landscape look like before we go down that road. Um, so those are the first two USPTO website and a Google search. If those both look pretty clean, 
Then I want you to do a domain check. So um, there's a couple of different services you can use. I like one called Name Checker, uh, but without the last E, it's Name Checker. <laughs> and we'll put that link in the show notes for this episode. Um, and that will also hit a lot of the social media sites. So you can see, does someone already have a handle for this same name? Does someone already have like an Instagram page or a Twitter account under the trademark that you are wanting to use for your course? Uh, again, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't use it because a lot of people are using social media handles, but not in a commercial way. And with trademarks, we really worry about use uh, of a trademark or a brand name to sell products or services. Somebody's just got a, a blog talking about celebrities or something, but they're not actually selling anything. That may not be something we need to be worried about. Uh, and a lot of the social media handles that we see are being used like that. They're just being used in a personal way, not in commerce, as we say in trademark law. Um, but you want to look at that. You want to know what's out there because you may stumble upon someone um, that you wouldn't have found otherwise by just finding social media handles and domain names. Now, what I see a lot when clients first come to me to register a trademark is they say, yeah, I did a domain search and it was it was fine. Nobody, you know, nobody had registered the domain, so I was clear. And that is absolutely not true. Um, you could be selling products or services under a totally unrelated domain, but still have trademark rights. Um, so that's why it's so important that you check the USPTO database and just do a Google search. Um, it's never a bad idea also, especially if you're thinking about a local business, to check your own state's secretary of state or whatever division of corporations. They're called different things in different states. Um, but to see if there's another company in your state already registered with the same name because you may not be able to um, set up a company with that name. Now with online courses, we're often not talking about a company name. This is more um, subject specific or targeted to just one course, but never a bad idea to also search there. Now, as I mentioned, this is not going to get you know the whole universe of search results that you might want if you were actually working with a trademark attorney but this is going to get you a good start this is what we would call a clearance search so you're just trying to see is this already obviously in use by someone else and i should steer clear or is it probably going to be fine and i can at least move forward start my marketing efforts start building my audience and start selling online courses and digital products so as I mentioned, again, we have a free guide that goes with this episode. You can go to awbfirm.com slash podcast 102 to get that. I definitely recommend it both to help you choose the name and stay away from those generic, um, unprotectable trademarks, get you towards descriptive, suggestive, the more protectable, and then also helping you do all of those searches that I went through. And again, episode 45, if you have more questions about how close is too close and what, um, how, how you can search for kind of things that aren't just the exact match, but that might be similar, but not exact. All right, next week, I want you to tune in because I have an interview with one of my very favorite people and one of my first clients here at the AWB firm, Dana Malstaff. You may know her as the boss mom. Um, we recently replayed her episode from season two of the podcast, but this is a brand new episode where I'm talking to her about her business now, which has a lot of courses. So she is an absolute powerhouse and I know you are going to really enjoy her talking about the evolution of her business, what she's doing now and how trademarks and a especially her boss mom trademark has really played into the growth of her business. So tune in next week and I will see you again soon.